if you concentrate the access to resources in the hands of a few, in, in the same way you concentrate the access to the production and distribution uh, in the planet to the hands, in the hands of a few, then uh, you will have a way of organizing the society that will be in the hands of a few, <laughs> on the ones that have access to that. Um, what now we are seeing with digital technologies is that we have been able to um, distribute the access to information, and that cre has created like a, a new form of uh, creating content media, sharing it around the world. Imagine that we bring that to the physical world. And in t instead of having just uh, you know, access to very few resources uh, in a specific places of the planet where there is a specific mine that is extracting a specific mineral to make this product, uh, we start to think about what surrounds us uh, is actually an, uh, a resource. And uh, so we come from the scarcity to an abundance. And then instead of having just factories where cheap labor is available, we can have factories that produce things on demand anywhere in the world. Then you start to democratize and, and also to distribute the access to the means of production. What if goods, services and materials were abundant rather than scarce? What if we created an economy based on distribution and access supported by the latest digital tools. What if that economy was regenerative by design, meaning we could put more back than we take out and still prosper? There are signs of change in our economy. This film takes up a part of the story of change and it is located in the cities, the world's cradle for innovation down the centuries, where a number of ideas and technologies are coalescing. We will see some of the synergies and cross-currents of a digital world meeting new forms of production, new and reinvented business, and different ways of organizing ourselves. New digital tools facilitate production and knowledge sharing at multiple levels of skill between a growing body of people. I am Tomas Diaz, I am a Venezuelan-born urbanist and I have been in Barcelona for the last 12 years. I, I was part of the team that set up the Fabla Barcelona back like more than a decade ago. Um, when we started Fabla Barcelona, there were like 10 Fab Labs in the world. Uh, it was quite difficult to convince people to come here. You, you were trying to tell them, okay, come to the Fab Lab, to the, to the, fab, to the what? What you do there? We use machines to make things. Why do you make that? Why? Why is that's not important? I can just buy it in IKEA. I can just go to the corner shop and, and buy it. No, no. What we're doing here is very important because we believe that people should learn how to make their own things, and because we believe that in some point we will have to make use of the resources that we have available and redesign our world as we want and being able of being inventors of our own reality. And that sounded like crazy. And it sounded like a very idealistic. Um, it was difficult for when I was Skyping with my parents that they are in Venezuela, it was really difficult to explain them what I was doing in Barcelona. Uh, and yes, it was easy to tell, and you know, 3D printing, and then some people, not even 3D printing was known uh, by that time. So fast forward 10 years, around a decade later, 10, 12 years later, there are 1,300 Fab Labs in the world. Uh, they are growing exponentially. Um, they are present in almost every major city in the world has a fab lab, at least. Um, I see them as cultural spaces and not as technology, uh, te technology places. These are places where you learn about a new culture, um, how we can use technology to transform reality. We can use technology for social good. We can use technology to address specific issues and specific needs. Now we are at a moment that there is a big change into how we design. How designs, um, they are now in, being informed by parameters that until now, first of all, we didn't have access to. 
And second of all, we didn't have the manual or intellectual power to work with that, no? Computation is helping us to deal with um, a big amount of data. And this allows us to create designs they are, that they are much more optimized and they are much more informed uh, on parameters, uh, from parameters that they are relevant to what we want to achieve. Sustainability parameters, environmental parameters, users' desires parameters, um, uh, resources that surround uh, what we construct, uh, all those have have been um, basically numbers that they were very difficult to manage to bring together into a design um, a decision or into a design process. We are seeing a convergence of technologies uh, as you know very few times we saw before. No? And when though we saw that previously, there were big transformation happening. Uh, one of those was the pre-industrial era, actually was similar to, to the, the, the era that we're living now. Um, we were seeing how different technologies were maybe being developed in a separated way, but they converged. Uh, so that's happening now with digital fabrication, uh, with blockchain technologies, uh, with uh, the, high, the super computation uh, power that we're achieving. Uh, the sophisticated way of using computers and generating a certain form of intelligence out of it. Um, and then also the advances on how we play with natural technologies or, or using synthetic biology to play with, uh, with nature as we never did before. So we are reinventing completely uh, how, the way we organize society and we should be aware of that. Uh, and use it with the right purpose. Adding more data to new fabrication tools doesn't automatically result in positive outcomes. Alicia Garmeluwicz at Materium.org wants us to use these tools with an eye on how the living world builds life. When it comes to digital meeting the physical world in this new economy, the amazing opportunity we have is to take inspiration from natural materials which are architected at all these multiple scales, so from the nano all the way to the macro level, our eyes can see. And what we can now do with digital fabrication technology, like 3D printers, for example, we can actually start to architect materials, lay down structure and pattern and geometry um, that enables simple building blocks, very, very simple material ingredients, ingredients that are useful for ecosystems that are nutrients for larger systems that we're all dependent on. These simple building blocks can be assembled in very complex ways. And when, because we have the technology now to do that, it opens up a world of material performance that currently we try and achieve with a lot of chemistry that is not very, it's not very good for anyone, um, as well as methods that use high pressure and high temperature. And so when you can substitute structure for chemistry, when you can substitute um, all of these industrial methods for the elegance of fabricating with digital technology, digital fabrication technology, it opens up the po potential of creating uh, an economy of the future that relies on material performance, but with a shared palette we can all participate in. I do think that um, the digital platforms um, give us a new and other experience. Um, what you see is that the digital platforms open up the world for us. So uh, there's um, all of a sudden you have far more goods and services uh, to pick from because it's all available online uh, and not only in your neighborhood uh, but also in another country. The internet and many digital platforms are not immune from criticism. Marlene Sticker of Waag has long been a digital pioneer. She believes a new business model is fundamental for a new inclusive internet. The models that have been implemented on the internet are all based on extraction and centralization of um, both the, the data, but also the algorithms, which you can't really read, so it's all a black box. Uh, the money is being centralized, so it's not a distributed um, um, business model, but a very much centralized business model. Um, 
I really believe that, that if we want to have another internet, we need to change the business model. And we have to come up with other solutions and other ways of growing uh, uh, value and also sustain the value creation uh, with technology and also with, uh, especially of course, uh, with, with services on the internet. And now we are being captured by some of players, I think, which are not really, um, they don't have any real public values at the heart of their companies. They have shareholder values. My fascination with the internet back in the 90s was because of its distributed nature of a protocol that it would allow to have not a centralized power but a distributed uh, power. And uh, again, this is still the disruptive factor of the internet. But we also saw in the last 25 years companies that again put some cent central services in 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 inside of it. So yes, decentralization is a very important aspect of the internet and I still believe this is the way to go to organize our cities, organize our communities, organize our, our knowledge and our, our, our infrastructure. At its best, the sharing economy gives, it gives every individual access to everything, maybe knowledge, maybe funding, maybe certain products, maybe a home, maybe transportation. Uh, so at its best, the sharing economy gives everyone access to everything that's already there. Um, Amsterdam Sharing City started with research that we did, where we found out that 84% of Amsterdam citizens are open to the sharing economy. And at the same time, we learned about Seoul, sharing city, Seoul, South Korea, which was the first sharing city in the world. And we saw the opportunity and we're thinking every movement needs its first follower, you know. If it's just Seoul, it's never going to be much bigger. So uh, uh, we went for it in Amsterdam and there was a classic window of opportunity because both of us were giving a, a presentation in different places in Amsterdam, speaking to rooms with a lot of policymakers in the room. And in my case, instead of speaking a lot about my research, I kept that to only a couple of minutes. And then I pitched in 15 minutes or so the potential of Amsterdam Sharing City. But as soon as we started talking to different organizations within Amsterdam, because we really believe that it shouldn't be only a governmental uh, perspective, but really from the city broad, is that there was a lot of enthusiasm to, uh, to uh, pick up the sharing economy and really see the city as some sort of a test bed and just say, okay, for all of us, it's really new. There are opportunities, there are challenges, and let's address them also together. So I've been working for the city of Amsterdam since 2010 and I think around 2013 I worked for the economic affairs department and I was working on the hotel policy at that time and during that period uh, we saw a new trend emerge that was that people would like to rent out their homes for instance uh, through uh, platforms like Airbnb and Booking and Vimdu. Um, and then I also started working on the policy of holiday rental. So I joined a team on uh, holiday rental. Um, and we, as a city, we said, well, this is an interesting trend going on. Um, we, we do allow people to rent out their home when, are, uh, when they are not, uh, not here, so if they are on holiday, but we want to set some rules. Um, one of the biggest challenges in the rise of the sharing economy and the emergence of large online platforms is that in our cities and in our countries there's a new digital infrastructure being laid on top of the physical infrastructure we already know. And whilst most governments are very well suited to govern their physical territory, it's actually quite hard to govern effectively what's happening in the digital space. And when there was only social media, that was not too problematic. But now with sharing economy platforms, it's really changing what's happening on your streets and in your neighborhoods, in your city. As everyone is surely aware, platforms like Airbnb and Uber cause upset in incumbent industries. Famously, hotel chains and taxi firms resisted what they saw as unfair competition. Meanwhile, network effects, the benefits of huge scale, brought the platform owners exceptional revenues. The ubiquitous and distributed internet is both its strength and its weakness. I think that with the rise of some of the largest platforms, uh, you get kind of a new balance of power. Uh, you often hear about the, the balance between nation states and some of the largest uh, platform firms in the world. But imagine if you are an average city, 
with less than a million in your population, yeah, how can you uh, make sure you, you maintain basically control of your own territory? And I think there you run into some serious challenges. And that's also one of the main reasons why we launched the, the Sharing Cities Alliance, in order to give cities more leverage to shape the sharing economy in their own cities by working together with their counterparts in other cities. We need to change uh, our economy for another strategy based in information and knowledge. And we need to change objects for services. We need to reduce the consume of the resources. We have to dematerialize the economy. If not, we don't have future. Our economy is hungry for materials. The take-make-dispose pattern of production and consumption doesn't fit with a finite material palette. A new economy will need to rethink material use and the very design of materials. So if you look at plastics production and the enormous problems that it creates in terms of accumulation in uh, ocean ecosystems, in, in other ecosystems all over the planet, what's interesting to unpack is to look at it's not necessarily a problem of volume of volume produced. So if you look at the amount that we have produced in terms of petrochemical plastics um, since 1950, it amounts to about 8 billion tons. And that may seem like a huge amount, and in a way it is. But then if you look at other production of natural materials in the biosphere every year, it dwarfs this production since 1950. So look at lignin and chitin, for example. Lignin is a building block for all plant matter, and uh, chitin is actually a, a building block, a biopolymer that is important for crustacean shells, so shrimps or crabs, etc. And both of those materials are produced annually in about 8 billion tons in the biosphere, so that's what's circulating. Then if you look at um, hemicellulose, um, which is another building block of plants, we're up to 60 billion tons. And then if you look at cellulose itself, which is a major component of all plant matter on the planet, we're talking about two teratons per year, which is 2,000 billion tons in circulation in the biosphere, causing no problem whatsoever, actually being food and being regenerative for ecosystems all over the planet. And by comparison, on an annual basis, we're producing about 322 million tons of petrochemical plastics year on year. So if you just think of those orders of magnitude different um, in terms of quantity, we need to really rethink um, not the amount we produce, but what we're producing it with. With very little uh, cost in terms of material, with almost no transport, we are able to construct in uh, real time um, sustainable, basically, buildings that they are using materials that they are 100% natural, they are, um, uh, you know, biodegradable or reusable, and um, it can also uh, open up possibilities of thinking that we can use those technologies for creating not only more sustainable buildings but also more accessible ones because the price uh, of such um, constructions um, is much lower than traditional ones and uh, finally it also opens up the possibility of using uh, uh, such uh, processes in order to go into areas where there are no resources or where there are maybe extreme um, environmental conditions so that you can um, uh, take advantage of automated machines to create um, uh, quick and accessible housings uh, out of the same material that you can find there uh, on site. Whether using locally available materials or not, the concept of a circular economy has generated a lot of interest from community groups, policy makers, businesses of all sizes, universities and urban planners. The role, the current role of our cities is not enough. It's quite nothing. And the unique solution is in our cities, is in the cities. Because the 70% of the emissions of CO2 
are made in the cities. The GPD in the world, the 80% of the GPD is made for the cities. The majority of people are living in the city and the solution is inside of the city. It depends on how we organize the future of our cities. We need, at the end, regenerate the cities and metropolises. For a long time, we have been uh, constructing, uh, thinking that our environments, our built space needs to be rigid and needs to be static. Um, today, in a, in a moment of acceleration in terms of where we live or how we work or how we communicate, um, uh, we realize that our needs are changing with uh, a very accelerated rhythm and therefore our environments need to be able to adapt to those uh, continuously changing needs. Um, traditionally, a building could not change at all. Traditionally, public space uh, was a space that uh, people could just uh, meet and interact, but um, the rest that surrounded us was uh, uh, pretty much um, um, static and pretty much uh, constructed in a way that uh, consumed a lot of resources, but giving back very little, if nothing. Um, technologies today would, uh, are able to allow us to rethink those spaces as much more dynamic, closer to believing organisms, right? Um, if we are able to um, apply into our built spaces functions that come from biology, biological functions, the same that living organisms have, for instance, filtering air or breathing or sweating as our, our, our body is doing or moving, no, kinetics. Uh, it's something that uh, can attribute to our built space the possibility of becoming much more uh, responsive and much more productive. Um, uh, if a building or a public space is able to adapt to environmental conditions, um, if we can achieve uh, passive ventilation or um, um, let's say heating with much less energy than we are doing today, if we are able to think that our buildings can, uh, will be able to generate energy, not only consume, generate food for their inhabitants, then the whole system of this idea of separated artifice and nature will collapse and then we will be talking about a kind of a more symbiotic uh, relationship between what we build, what it is considered uh, artifice and what is natural. Our cities are not blank sheets of paper. To reverse decades of urban planning decisions takes time and a compelling vision. Barcelona's Superblocks initiative has gained international renown for setting system conditions to enable much more social and economic interaction. Well, the Superblock is um, an urban mobility uh, plan that has been developed by um, Barcelona Ecología Urbana. Uh, is, a, is an office of ecology and planning here in Barcelona led by Salvador Rueda. Uh, they decided to apply this master plan that um, merges nine urban blocks of the typical Barcelona Cerda grid and reduces the mobility in the interior of the block. So the majority of the traffic happens in the periphery, uh, opening up a big percentage of public space in the interior of the block. Uh, it is a very um, controlled um, traffic inside, which means on the one hand, low velocity, but on the other hand, not everybody can cross the block in order to move from one point to another, but only the residents can enter, and then the ones that they really want to move, they, they use the periphery. So this, all of a sudden, it gives back to a neighborhood like more than 65 or 70 percent of public space. It also reduces uh, you know, like danger of traffic accidents. And more importantly, it increases the quality of air because it's actually reducing contamination from traffic. It's quite impossible to see 
uh, the children playing in the public space. It's not the case of the public house of block. You can see this. And people eating in the fiesta, uh, making a sport, uh, uh, playing the children. Uh, we have more than 50 activities, different activities developed inside of the new super block. Because the flexibility of the public space is different. The interchange, the market, the leisure, all kind of leisure, the culture, the art, the, cult, the knowledge inside of the public realm, even the expression, manifestation, and democratic aspects. The Agora, the new Agora is our public space. But if you want to obtain all of these rights, if you want to develop all these uses, is only possible if you change the current urban mobility model. If not, it's not possible. And the super blocks allow us to open a new city with a urban quality very high and a quality of life incredible. Because at the end, the city is a place to connect people between them. The Commons is a shared resource that if it's not governed well, can be subject to or vulnerable to being overexploited or not being provided in the first place. So for example, in the case of natural, a natural commons like the ocean, we all know that it's overexploited when it comes to fishing, for example, um, because no one owns um, owns the ocean, but yet we all use and need it. Um, and at the same time, it's also vulnerable to pollution problems, etc. And so that's one, one issue. Another issue would be, um, another example would be a knowledge commons. So for example, Wikipedia, you would think that there is a, a dilemma or it's vulnerable to not being provided in the first place because the people who are contributing, um, a lot of people access it without needing to contribute. Right? And so this is actually a success story though when you actually think about what are the rules that govern the use of it and that has a lot to do with the way in which these common resources can be uh, regenerative and replenished in the future. And so if you look at the way in which um, commons are entering into fabrication, entering into making things, you see very successful examples of open source software being a common good you also a public good and you also see um, examples of this entering into open source hardware as well and at the core of this is is deep knowledge at a local level from the contributors perspective from these um, spaces of fabrication of knowing how to make um, these these goods themselves if you look to nature for inspiration for how materials are composed, what ingredients are used, what methods of chemistry are, are, are employed, is that you see a very clear set of templates for the way in which you can build materials for our, our, um, our economy. And the key thing with open source is that the secret's already out. Organisms have been composing materials with this set of ingredients for billions of years and in ways that we're only beginning to be able to truly understand and, and replicate and be inspired by. And so when you start from that place, the materials that you're then working with are open source by definition because organisms have open sourced them billions of years ago. And so all we need to do is, is pay attention and learn from them. From materials to software design, open source, commons-based development 
has been on the rise for over two decades. The Linux operating system is used by most of us, every day, whether we know it or not. High-speed digital makes it easier to collaborate wherever we are in the world. There are signs the typical business model of internet-based companies is changing. Well, basically, you can think of two models, and maybe more, but the ones that are based on classical market principles are based on shareholder value driven. So they, they look for quarterly growth and they need to have, um, they need to have a world domination. Otherwise, they, they can't predict their growth. They can't bring the shareholders what they want. Uh, but we also have seen that large parts of the internet are, are being created as commons with a service industry next to it. So basically you create a lot of data or services or software which is open and everybody can access it. And it's an open resource for everybody. Um, and I think that, that model could be much more sustainable. It's much more, uh, it's based on reciprocity. It's based on uh, not extraction, but uh, value that is being captured within the community. And again, uh, the, there are a lot of uh, examples like Linux and Red Hat that there's a lot of service industry possible around a commons, around a resource. So we have to re re regain this commons thinking also, not on the, only on the basis of the, the Unix and some of the deeper laying uh, technologies, but also in the applications. And uh, building business models that are not extractive and are taking uh, also, are accountable democracy by design, privacy by design. A lot of people think that the internet has to be against privacy because it is the internet, but it's not the internet itself, it's the business model uh, which wants to have this data. So we can design privacy and have really great services at the same time. The rhythm of acceleration of Fab Labs is, is something amazing. Um, the whole network or the founders um, uh, of the Fab Lab uh, itself, they are surprised with that growth. But I think that that is a very clear symptom of, um, of, a, of a growing society that really wants to participate into everything that surrounds them. So we are not the passive consumers anymore. We know that we do not need necessarily to go and pick from the self what it is offered to us, but we can have um, the possibility of uh, choosing exactly what we need, customized to our needs, to our space, and then have access to be able to produce that. Originally, in my, in my master's degree, I was studying industrial ecology. And it's an area which looks at resource flows that are cycled between companies, so that one company's food is another's resource. And one of the main structural difficulties in today's economy, when you think about cycling of materials, is that manufacturing is incredibly centralized. And so to be able to collect all these bits of waste and pipe it back into a centralized manufacturing system is incredibly difficult, both logistically and economically. And so I had that in the back of my mind, but I didn't have a really sharp res uh, research question at the time when I went into my PhD. So that was my background. But then looking for a PhD question, I went on uh, what my supervisor called a fishing trip, which I went to the, the biomimicry summit. Um, in the US at the time. And I heard from Janine Benyus um, about 3D printing for the first time. And it was really interesting to hear about 3D printing first from a biologist, because she looked at it through the eyes of how organisms actually compose materials layer by layer and, and building up materials from, um, from that perspective, rather than cutting them down to from a block of material. We often cut an object. Um, in terms of the way in which we manufacture today. And so thinking about 3D printing with that logic, I um, fell in love with the idea of, of the technology and what it could do. And then reading further, I realized that by that very logic of composition, by the very logic of making things, it enabled a more decentralized, distributed manufacturing world. And when I realized that, I had this incredible moment of what if, what if, 
this was the key or a fabrication in a digital form, a digitally informed fabrication like 3D printing, was the key to unlocking this structural rigidity, the structural difficulty in today's economic system with respect to cycling resources. If we can manufacture and consume at local scales, at regional scales, etc., we can actually source and cycle materials more appropriately, more effectively. So there's a real drive to create circular economies. Let me just never travel without a bit of hose pipe, right? So the linear 20th century economy would take us materials, make them into stuff we want, use it for a while and throw it away. And that linear system needs to be turned into a closed loop. There's a real danger that individual companies will say, well, send the materials back to us and we will create a circular loop. But you could end up with hundreds, thousands of these individual little loops. That will never work because nature would laugh at us. Nature doesn't work in segmented circularity. Nature creates an ecosystem of resource use so that resources, be they plastics or metals or textiles, are brought back into the ecosystem, broken down to their fundamental materials and reused again. Think of nature, she turns things back into cellulose, lignin, chitin, keratin, and builds anew. We have to create ecosystems of resource use and they are inherently distributed by design. A decentralized economy, working at multiple scales, enabled by new digital technologies, using materials and components that have been made to be made again. The ideas are gaining traction and changing minds all over the globe. But a collection of new technologies or materials is nothing without a narrative or a way of thinking to bind them all together. And, and, a narrative is really important. It's, it's one of the most important things that we have. And we have been in a very strange narrative over the last hundred years. And I think changing this narrative, that people understand that there are other possibilities, that this narrative is something that is holding us back, this old narrative. And that we have to start to, 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 and to, more, to bring more narratives to the surface and understanding this new narrative. I think this is that we are super cooperators, that people are actually uh, intentionally, we survive because we cooperate. And this is really another story than the one that we survive because we compete. If we don't have this other narrative, we are lost. In the future economy, I think that really what we're talking about is filling in levels of scale in terms of the in, in, in our industrial system that are currently being undernourished. And really that is, at this stage, local and regional scales of production. And so what we're talking about in a future scenario is how we can have nested levels of production that make sense. Now the only caveat to this is the global scale, there may be global actors in terms of large corporates, but from a material flow perspective, I firmly believe that we need to source and cycle nutrients at local and regional scales. The idea that corporates couldn't, and multinational corporates couldn't actually make sure that their product portfolios are locally adaptive, locally appropriate to the feedstock and the nutrients that are sourced um, within their geographies where demand is. That's, that's entirely possible and it's already happening in some product sectors. If you, if you look back uh, on the type of major infrastructure investment that has been made in cities in the last century and a half, it's related to the movement of materials and people is ports, airports, highways, tunnels, trains. So all the infrastructure is to move atoms. So if we're going to move just bits around the world, then cities will need a different type of infrastructure. They will need to be able to handle local material flows in a way that we cannot imagine yet. Uh, businesses will have to become not only a storehouse or, or warehouses to store stock, but actually they need to become flexible factories and manufacture on demand. Um, consumers, they just don't work in order to buy things that they don't need because there is someone else designed that thing that they don't need, actually. But they become part of the design and production process of the products they want and they need for the reality. So all of that uh, in, is possible in this vision 
that we believe Fab City is, and we believe Fab Labs play a fundamental role um, because it will become the catalyst of this transition. So one of the things that we are very much involved in is, is rethinking learning and rethinking the educational system. So the maker movement also moves into the educational system with maker education. And this is not just to bring creativity and technology into the schools, but it, we see it as a disruptor of creating learning communities, of peer-to-peer -peer learning, of, of problem solving, about approaching knowledge in a different way. You know, I think maker education can bring all this to the, to the table. And by putting this as a center of learning, you will also have other people the, the capacity of people to, to, to be part of this movement, to, to, for the, the uh, distributive by design, thinking about other, out of, out of the box, out of the black box into other solutions, this capacity will grow. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of the education is still just copying what generations before have done before. And I believe we should create new knowledge and new approaches and new capacities for the future. If we're going to make this kind of transformation, it's not just at the level of material flows, I really deeply believe it's in the terms of the mindset of the economy we bring. I think the 20th century was dominated by a mindset which was driven by proprietary ownership, not just of materials, but ideas, intellectual property. And we need to move to free and open source design so that we have shared standards, knowledge governance in the commons, so that indeed we can have a network that connects. When I talk to 21st century urban designers, product designers, enlightened corporate leaders, social startups, they're asking a completely different question. How many benefits can we layer into the way that we design this? What could this enterprise do for the community, for culture, for the living world? What can it give back? Because we recognize we're part of a system of mutuality. And that's an utterly different place where the business design comes from. I think we're moving from extractive to generative in the way we design what business can be and do in the world. It's painful, especially if you're in one business that's trying to make that change, but this is the drama of our times and of course it is also the adventure of our times. Thank you.